So welcome to today's webinar on managing financial difficulty and debt presented for you by the Consumer Action Law Centre. My name's Carly, I'm from Community Legal Centres Queensland and before we get started I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're holding this webinar today. So in Brisbane they are the Turrbal and the Yagara people. I wish to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders continue to play in our society. As this webinar is being viewed by people throughout Queensland and Australia and as our presenters are outside of Queensland, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land throughout the country and extend a welcome to any First Australians listening in today. So today's webinar is on managing financial difficulty and debt and you'll be hearing um, a slightly different perspective today. We've got a financial counselling um, slant on this issue. So as community professionals working to help disadvantaged and vulnerable people, it's really important to understand the financial difficulties our clients sometimes face. So they can be struggling with mounting bills and debt and may be unaware of their options. So having a framework to help our clients understand their options um, to improve their financial situation is a really important part of helping them get back on their feet. So today we've got Shungu and Janet from the Consumer Action Law Centre and they're going to um, talk about um, some of the difficulties that our clients face from that financial counselling perspective and also offer some tips for you uh, for how you can best support your clients. So as per usual we will um, take questions at the end but feel free to start typing the questions into the question box as they come up for you um, and then I'll read them all out at the end to our presenters who will be able to answer those questions. Um, if we go, if we, as we go through, if you do have any um, other issues that you need to raise, such as sound issues or anything like that, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well and I'll try and manage that from this end. Alternatively, you can send me an email and I'll see that as well. Um, so I think, oh, actually, I will let you know this webinar is being recorded as well. So we'll pop the uh, recording up on our website this afternoon. I've sent out the PowerPoints from Consumer Action to everyone who registered um, late this morning and I haven't uploaded them to the handout section, but I'll do that now just while we're chatting. Um, so if you need to download those, you can. They're also on our website. Uh, so I think that's everything for me for the moment. So I'll pass over to our fabulous presenters for today. Um, take it away, Janet and Shungu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Shungu Patsika. I'm a senior financial counsellor here at Consumer Action. And I'm Janet Ingalls, um, also a financial counsellor here at Consumer Action. Great. So to begin with, I might just explain a little bit about our Consumer Action and what we do here um, as the financial counselling team. So Consumer Action is a campaign focused community advocacy organisation based in Melbourne. And as a community legal centre, our Consumer Action provides free legal advice and pursues litigation on behalf of vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers across Victoria. And then Consumer Action operates the National Debt Helpline. And so that is the team that Janet and I are a part of. And we cover Victoria as well. And we are a not-for-profit telephone financial counselling service. And so what the National Debt Helpline does is provide free, confidential and independent telephone financial counselling advice to Victorians. Uh, and particularly Victorians experiencing financial difficulty. Now, I just wanted to clarify um, because I'm pretty sure I'm speaking to financial counsellors or people who um, work with financial counsellors and just want to clarify that at the National Debt Helpline, uh, we don't engage uh, in advocacy directly or uh, negotiation for our clients. Uh, and we don't do that in the same way as local uh, services. However, we do refer clients that need financial counselling um, and a financial counsellor who, uh, to act on their behalf. Um, we do refer those clients uh, to their local agencies. Right, so we'll move on to the next slide. So today's session, all right. So um, as has been mentioned, we're gonna look at 
financial difficulty from a financial counseling perspective. And so at the end of the day, there's basically two sort of uh, things we're hoping you as our workers will be able to um, confidently do, uh, you know, once you've uh, participated in this webinar. And so um, this webinar is about understanding how you can help your clients who are experiencing financial difficulty. And so we're hoping that you as a worker will be able to, number one, spot the relevant issues affecting clients that are in financial difficulty. And then number two, watch, uh, work out and, and know what you can do initially to assist your clients. So we aren't expecting you to become financial counselors from this webinar. Um, there's gonna be a lot of information we provide and certainly we're not expecting you to memorize it all, but it's just about knowing what the issues are affecting clients in financial difficulty and what you can initially do to help the clients. Okay, so what does financial difficulty look like? Now, financial difficulty comes in many forms, from debts people can't pay to problems covering essential expenses, such as rent, utilities, and other living expenses. Now, as we are speaking to workers based throughout the country, Today, we're going to be limited to discussing those financial matters that are covered by national laws, regulations, and guidelines. It's for this reason that we will talk in more detail about problems with debt collection and credit reporting. We will look at financial hardship relating to credit contracts, and we'll also look at bankruptcy towards the end. Now, we do understand that financial difficulty goes beyond issues of credit and solvency slash bankruptcy. Um, and so at the end of the, of the webinar, we will uh, look at providing information to assist with issues which are more state-based. Uh, and so that covers utility bills, housing, tenancy, and emergency relief, uh, as well as referrals and resources um, regarding any fines your clients have. And we, unfortunately, we can't talk um, to those issues in a lot of detail uh, because um, the, the regulations covering those areas are primarily uh, state or territory based. So here's the overview of today's session. And so in the subjects we'll be covering, and I'll provide a summary of uh, what we'll be looking at shortly, um, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, debt collection, as in the process involved and how to deal with aggressive and persistent creditors. And I'm sure uh, you've had clients who've been experiencing uh, those sorts of challenges uh, from debt collectors and creditors. We'll be looking at credit reporting and credit scores, specifically what happens when a debt isn't paid. Now, how does the, how's that noted on, on someone's credit file? Then we'll look at hardship options. Okay, so this is options uh, for dealing with debts when a person is in financial hardship, and they are both short-term and long-term options that will be covered. And then finally, we'll look at what happens when someone is unable to pay their debts and is perhaps considering bankruptcy. And so the format will be um, shared between me and Janet. Janet will cover the first section on debt collection. I'll cover credit reporting. Janet will then look at hardship. And at the end, I'll speak about bank bankruptcy. Okay. Now I'd like to hand over to Janet, who's gonna chat to us about debt collection. Thanks very much, Shungu. Okay, as Shungu mentioned, I'm sure there are times when um, you have uh, people come into your office and they uh, talk about being hounded by debt collectors. So what we're going to cover in this session is um, just a review of what debt collection is, um, how and when debt collectors can contact you, 
and what to do if you're unhappy about a debt collector's behaviour. We've got a little um, scenario up there. Oops, we've got one away. Um, which is about Sally. Um, so Sally comes into your office and she's got a big plastic bag worth of demand letters from a debt collector on an old credit card that she hasn't been able to pay. Sally is potentially going to be quite anxious. Um, debt collection is a really stressful experience for people. Um, because of those reasons we touched on where debt collectors' behaviour can be pretty aggressive and generally pretty very persistent. The other thing that can happen is that the, the, um, the person might not even know why the debt collector is calling. It might be because the debts are for some time ago um, or because they just can't remember what's been happening. So this can create even more anxiety. Debt collectors collect all types of debts. Um, they collect credit cards, it might be a personal loan, it could be old phone and gas bills. And it's where um, the original creditor, so a creditor is somebody that you originally owed money to, um, you might have gone into a contract to borrow money or to, for services, so that original creditor is not being paid and they are now um, have passed it on to the debt collector who's pursuing the debt. One thing to note is if um, the person you're seeing actually presents and they've got letters from a lawyer or they've got letters from the court, this can be a really urgent matter. Um, so what we would say, the best practice in that instance is to actually either contact the National Debt Helpline, um, your local financial counselling service, or even a community legal centre to get further advice. Um, debts can be sold to, a, so a debt collector might be collecting the debt on behalf, acting for a creditor, it might also be that the creditor, original creditor has sold the debt to the debt collector. And that situation there to be aware of is that very often a debt collector has bought that debt from that original creditor for an awful lot less than the debt is actually, the actual face value of the debt. Okay, so when someone is contacted by a debt collector, the really key message that I'm, I think it would be really important for you to take away from this particular slide is that it's really important for the person not to acknowledge or make any payments on the debt. Um, the reason for that is that it's, it's possible that the person either, um, that the debt isn't theirs because debt collectors make mistakes, just like all of us, um, and it may be that the person has a legal defence against that debt. And, and the warning here is that if, if the person has acknowledged the debt or made, or made a payment against that debt, they might lose some of their rights. And Shungu, I think, is just going to give us a little bit of an insight into what that, what that might mean, what, what, arrange, what legal defence that might be. Thanks so much, Janet. So when it comes to debt collection, it's really important uh, for us to understand that there actually are time limits um, in which a creditor or someone who is owed uh, a debt um, must act to enforce or take legal action in relation to that debt. And so when it comes to all debts uh, that come, uh, you know, come to clients or that you come across as, as workers, uh, the person who uh, is being pursued for the debt uh, might actually be able to rely on the fact that the creditor is no, long, no longer within the time frame that debt can be pursued legally. Now that time frame does change from state to state and, and the term we use here in Victoria for such debts is that they're statute barred and so as Janet is saying it's very important for that person not to acknowledge the debt and certainly not to pay that debt until we as a financial counsellor can ascertain whether that debt is statute barred and outside the time limit uh, available to a creditor to pursue it. Thanks, Shongu. So I guess, yeah, the other, the other message there is that if there's any doubt, um, always get a financial counsellor involved or sometimes a local community legal centre can assist as well. 
if it is that um, that's been clarified, the person is confident that the debt is theirs, that the debt is correct, um, and that there's no legal defence, the next step is to make a plan about how to deal with the debt. And we're going to talk in more detail when we get to um, our session on financial hardship about various options for dealing with debts. But again, another message is that if a person's situation is really complex or they're in financial, real severe financial hardship, or they're a little, just a little bit overwhelmed with everything, um, a financial counsellor can assist them to help work out a plan and work through their options for managing the debts. One of the key things that um, happens with debt collection agencies, as we've talked about, is the, the way they go about their business, the way they go about trying to collect debts. And what's important to understand is that people have rights. There is guidelines, there's rules around how and when and where debt, collect and debt collectors can contact people. And there are also prohibited behaviours. And this applies whether it's determined if the debt is, is owed or not. It just applies across the board to the way they, they engage with people. So they're, they're at their behaviour must always be respectful, they, must, they mustn't threaten, they mustn't intimidate, they mustn't harass, and they mustn't give misleading statements. And a person also has a right to be represented by someone else, such as a financial counsellor. And if that is the case, then the debt collector should always then make contact with that person's representative. So in this instance, if it was a financial counsellor, they should talk to the financial counsellor and not directly to the person themselves. So we'll talk now a little bit about some of the specifics in regards to people con to debt collections making contact. I've got a little summary there on the slide. So you can see there are some quite specific rules and guidelines around when they can and cannot um, contact people. It's good to be aware that contact can be by phone, by text, by letter, by email, even social media is used these days. And if they've been unable to contact people through those methods, they can actually contact someone at home or at work, and we'll, we'll look at some of the, the guidelines around that in a moment. Be also aware that sometimes people are receiving multiple contacts from the same debt collector. Um, if there's more than one debt with that one particular debt collector, they were, the rules allow them to contact for each individual debt. So that sometimes can be why people feel like they're getting more contacts doesn't take away from the fact that they shouldn't be doing it more than they're required and their behaviour has always got to be, as we spoke about earlier, um, respectful. We're just going to touch briefly on when they're contacting you and the requirements when they're contacting you at home. Again, you can see the, the list of things there. It's, it's probably too much for me to run through all of them. Um, but some of the, the key things that if you ask them to leave, they must go. They're not allowed to hang around your house looking as if they're surveilling. No more than one visit for, per month and you can see the time frames there. And overall, they must treat you with respect and courtesy and respect your right to privacy. And really important that they don't engage with any um, people under 18, start having conversations with them about the debts, unless you've given authority for them to, for the child to act as, or the person under 18, to act as an interpreter or as a representative for you. In regards to if they're visiting you at work, um, this is generally done only as a last resort when they've had, have been completely unable to contact a person in any other way. If they do come to the workplace, they mustn't re reveal that they're coming um, because it's related to a debt. And they must immediately leave the workplace if they're asked by the person whose debt it is or someone else at the workplace. Okay, so the things that happen when a debt collector behaves badly, and that's where you believe that there's been intimidating, intimidation, harassment, or they've breached any of those timeframes that we spoke about earlier. Um, what you can do is make a complaint about that. Now, this is something that, generally speaking, it's a great idea to get a uh, financial counsellor to assist you with, again, or a community legal service. Um, something to remember is if you feel like there's been threats of physical um, or threat of violence or physical violence, that should be reported to the police. 
and the breaches of those debt collecting rules and guidelines and behaviours that we've talked about. Um, briefly, the process is that you would initially make a complaint to the company itself. And then failing that, if you're not able to sort of get a, um, a handle on the behaviour that way, if there's still more issues, um, then you can make a complaint to uh, the relevant ombudsman. And a person may be eligible for uh, compensation if there's been breaches of behaviour or guidelines. And that's for things like um, if they've been experiencing humiliation or distress or in fact out-of-pocket expenses caused by the debt collector's conduct. Keep a record of any contact that you're having. And um, again, remember that a, a financial counsellor can assist with this process. So that's even a bit of a summary there. And um, I'll hand back to Sean Goon. Thank you. Now, a question that comes up, especially when debt collectors are involved or fair issues around a person's credit and credit worthiness um, is um, what, what um, is on my credit report and uh, what, what can, I, can I do about it? Now, if the people you help have ever applied for credit or a loan, there will be a report about each of them with a credit reporting agency. And this information is used by lenders uh, to assess um, the person's ability to repay credit or pay for a certain service. And so with this topic, um, we're just going to uh, focus on a, a scenario uh, where John, who is an aged pensioner, lives in a remote area and needs a phone plan. But he goes into the shop and applies uh, for a phone plan and that application for the service is declined. And he is convinced that it's because his credit has been blacklisted. And as part of uh, his concerns, he thinks that perhaps there's a debt on his credit file, which he owes from 10 years ago. And perhaps that's behind his bad credit rating. So the first thing we want to explain uh, to John is what is a credit report? So a credit report contains information about someone's credit history and the information is collected from credit providers, courts and other organisations and it's collated by what are called credit reporting agencies. And as you can see on the slide, those are a couple of examples of the credit reporting agencies um, out there. Now, the information on a person's credit file would include um, defaults, credit infringements and judgments, and I will speak about those shortly. However, what I haven't covered today, just for the sake of time, are changes to a credit file that cover your repayment history. And so it's important to know that as of the 1st of July, 2018, your repayment history information or RHI will note how far you fall behind on repayments. Now it's a reasonably complicated regime. Um, and so for the sake of time, I will send through or Preeti will send through information about uh, the RHI and how uh, a client's repayment history is detailed on the credit file. For now, we're just going to focus on uh, defaults, credit, uh, serious credit infringements and judgments. Now, broadly speaking, um, what you need to know about credit scores and reporting? Well, number one, it's a fairly complex area. Okay, and so again, we're not expecting you to be across all of this in detail. And were there any doubts about what's going on in the credit file, please refer uh, your client to a financial counselor. Uh, but essentially, credit reporting agencies want you to pay for services such as accessing your credit file and, and to do so when they're actually available to you free of charge. They also offer to reveal your credit score, which many people assume is an objective measure of one's credit worthiness. Now, the reality with your credit score is that um, you actually, by signing up to get that information, agreeing to allow your personal information to be disclosed to third parties. 
and that's for marketing purposes. So these free credit score providers are really lead generation services designed to market to you. And so, as I've just mentioned, one of the things they do is that they share your data um, and they basically alert debt collectors um, of your current whereabouts. And that's something that uh, a lot of people aren't aware of, that when you apply for your credit file or try to get your credit score, you're putting yourself on the system that many debt collectors can access. And for a lot of people, they're surprised that after they access their credit file, all of a sudden, debt collectors are chasing debts which a person had forgotten about or hadn't heard about for a very long time. So before accessing a credit file, we really do suggest a person contact a financial counsellor. And we encourage you to, um, you know, we encourage you to uh, suggest that your clients contact a financial counsellor before they pay to get um, a credit file. And what we can do is explain the consequences, obviously, as well as um, give them information on how they can access their credit file free of charge. So what is on a credit file? The first um, sort of notation on there is an overdue payment, which we commonly refer to as a default. Now, if your client doesn't make a payment on a debt, uh, the credit provider or may refer the debt to a debt collector and report that debt to a credit reporting agency and ask them to list a default on your credit file. And so listed there on the slide are the requirements a creditor must uh, uphold or fulfill before they can list the default on a credit file. And as part of listing a default on the credit file, just be aware that, um, and it's, it's the point at the bottom that you need to be informed that they're going to do that, okay? But the amount must be at least $150 and at least 60 days must have passed since the last payment was made on the debt. Moving on to serious credit infringements. So this is an even more severe listing where the creditor is unable to contact a person with a debt or where the credit provider suspects that the person incurred the debt by fraud. Now, I haven't seen a lot of these, um, but just be aware that it is it can be listed on a credit file. And a key point uh, to take home regarding serious credit infringements is that um, the credit provider or, the, or the, the debt collector must first meet the requirements of listing a default before they can list a serious credit infringement. And so court judgments are also listed on the credit file. And these go on there when the credit provider sues the person and obtains orders from the court stating that the amount stated in the, in the court documents is owed by the person who was sued. And so you may recall earlier I was talking about people, re, um, re, people relying on certain time frames and, and if the debt uh, collection is occurring after that certain time frame that the person has a defense. Um, the defense the person has is in relation to these court judgments. Okay, so simply put, the creditor can't get a judgment against the person if the debt collection falls outside of the time frame um, that is available to a, a, a creditor or a debt collector to pursue. Okay, so uh, very important that if there's a judgment involved, get in touch with a financial counselor. Now, how long will uh, defaults and, and other notations be listed? Uh, and you can see right there. Um, so there's a common misconception that once something is listed on your credit file, your credit, credit worthiness is ruined forever. And that's simply not the case. Um, when it comes to your credit file, as you can see, the notations do eventually come off. And so for a default and a serious credit, sorry, for a default and a judgment, um, those will be listed on there for five years. However, for a serious credit infringement, that extends out to seven years. Some key points to remember in rela uh, relating uh, to how long defaults and other notations are, are listed on your credit file. Number one, paying off 
the debt does not remove legitimate default listings. And where, pay, where a person does pay the debt, um, that they can actually ask the credit reporting agency to, to note on the credit file that the debt has either been paid or settled. Now, it's not really um, clear how creditors will respond or view a default or another notation which is listed as settled or paid, but a person can ask for that information uh, to be updated if they pay the debt. Now, when it comes to accessing uh, your credit file, and as long as the person is aware of the consequences of doing so, uh, then you can get a copy of your credit file for free once a year, and you must receive it within 10 days of your request. Now, if someone wants to get a copy of their credit file sooner, they might then have to pay for that, or if you want to get more than one copy in a year. And in the information that we send through, we will provide details on how a person can access their credit file. Um, and that could be to either go on uh, the internet for a credit reporting agency or simply call them, or you can use one of the template letters that we have available uh, for you. Now, I just want to quickly cover this topic. Um, debt vouchers um, are the bane of our existence here at Consumer Action. Okay, so what do I, what do I mean by a debt voucher? Okay, so basically these are businesses which can be categorized in those four groups. And trust me, you can easily recognize them by their names, okay? So there's some which provide debt um, negotiation services, and one of them is actually called debt negotiators. Um, some provide credit repair. I don't know if you've heard of Credit Clean Australia. Um, some offer part nine debt agreements. One uh, debt voucher that comes to mind there is Fox Signs, and there are some which also provide personal budgeting services, and I'm sure we've all heard of my budget. So my view when it comes to these debt vouchers is that um, it's, we shouldn't really call them debt management firms as this legitimizes them. Hence, the name we use as consumer action is debt vouchers because to be honest, they prey on the financially vulnerable. And, and so if there's just one take home I would like to make is that with um, people in financial difficulty, they should not have to pay uh, to access assistance um, you know, around managing that financial difficulty, okay? So these are the problems with the debt vouchers. They charge high fees, they target people in stress, um, they don't necessarily give a person all their options. Now, if a person has an issue with obtaining credit or a mistake on their credit file, we suggest that they do not go to one of these debt vouchers or so-called debt management services, okay? Please see a financial counselor and we will be able to assist you for free. And so if there are any issues with a person's credit file, um, they can get a free copy of their credit report as I detailed uh, before. Um, they can check it for any mistakes that are on there. And you have the option of complaining either to the credit reporting agency or the creditor who listed the default or, or other notation, or you can make a complaint to the relevant ombudsman services. And we as financial counselors can help people navigate uh, all of that uh, if it gets a bit too difficult. So I just want to reiterate, if in doubt, come to a financial counselor. Please do not go to these debt vultures. Um, we are there uh, at the National Debt Helpline uh, to assist people in financial difficulty and look at their options. And we always look at what is in the person's best interest. Uh, we're not really trying to push them one way or another. Uh, and then certainly we wouldn't be suggesting they go see a debt vulture. And on that note, I'm going to hand back to Janet. Thanks, Shungu. And I, I think, I hope that debt vulture message got through loud and clear because it's a really strong one that we um, would like you to take away. So I'm going to have 
a chat now about what happens when someone is in financial hardship. Um, and I would say that that's a number of the people that you're seeing every day. So we've got um, just a little example that we thought we'd refer to. We've got Miriam. She's a single parent um, and she's recently fallen behind on her car loan repayments because she's lost her job. She's really worried because in order to find a new job, she needs her car and she's very concerned that because she can't make the payments on the car, she's going to, there's risk to that car. So that's one scenario that a person might find themselves in. Um, there's obviously a numerous um, situations when someone finds themselves in financial hardship. It might be as happened for Miriam that she's lost a job or a family member's lost their job. It could be due to illness, it could be due to injury, family breakdown, family violence, any number of different options. And the other um, real cause, often frequent cause for financial hardship is that someone's on a low income. Um, they may be on a Centrelink income only or their work might be casual or irregular. Financial hardship comes in short and long term. So a short term financial hardship um, option for dealing with financial hardship is when someone needs um, a hardship arrangement just for a few weeks or months to recover from illness or injury or to find a new job as Miriam's situation or it might be more of a long-term hardship situation where their, their financial circumstances um, it's a more permanent situation like we talked about in terms of a low income and their, their circumstances are unlikely to change. So you might find somebody's coming into your office a bit like they did with the debt collector. They've received phone calls or they've got text or they've had a letter from their creditors saying that they've fallen behind. And we'll just reiterate again here, if they do present with a letter from a lawyer or a court document, once again, that could be a really urgent situation. So please do take um, steps for them to contact a financial counsellor or the National Debt Helpline. So, some of the steps to take when someone comes in and they're in financial difficulty. Um, probably one of the most important things is that they actually get in touch with their creditor to let them know what's happening, to let them know that they're in financial difficulty, um, that they're experiencing some short-term hardship and to discuss what the options are going to be for managing the debt. Um, they can also check if they've got any insurance. Sometimes there is um, insurance on credit pro products, so that's worth looking into because it may be possible to make the claim. And you can read more about this on uh, the National Debt Helpline website. Next step is always good to do a budget so the person can work out what they can afford to pay, or in fact, if they can afford to pay anything. Um, and it's good to do that it, sometimes you useful to do that actually before you speak to the creditor. And there's a really great uh, budgeting tool on the Money Smart website run by the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. And we'll have um, some links to all of those resources at the end of the presentation. So they've done their budget. Um, as we said, next step, have a chat with the creditor. Um, and the key word when you're speaking to the creditor is to mention that you want to speak to the hardship department and that you're in financial hardship. Um, some creditors will, will refer to it as their hardship department. Some of them might call it their customer assist. But if you use the words financial hardship, um, or the uh, this person you're supporting uses the words financial hardship, they should get themselves through to the correct area. And it's a good idea to be prepared when you give your, make the call. Make sure you've got the account details, you've got a, um, your budget, um, and, and a bit of an understanding of, you know, <coughs> being able to describe what your hardship situation is. And always keep records of any conversations that you've had with the creditor. So that's, you know, name of the person, date, time, and what was discussed. So some of the um, short-term hardship options that um, we can look at uh, are things where you would seek um, a short-term stop on payments, sometimes known as a moratorium or a repayment holiday. These are usually for a period of three months where the payments are stopped. And once that period is finished, then the payments will recommence. 
Um, oftentimes, you can also, where you've had a period of time where you've um, stopped the payments for that short time, um, they can then also do an ex uh, extend or vary the loan, where any arrears, so that's any missed payments, can be um, added on to the end of the loan. And this is particularly for um, personal loans or car loans or mortgages. Um, so that the missed payments would be added onto the loan and the term of the loan extended. One of the other options is to negotiate what we call a full and final settlement. And this, this comes into play if someone has um, an unexpected windfall, perhaps they've got a tax refund, and they may be able to put forward an offer, um, an amount of money which is not the full value of the debt, but they're making an offer in full settlement. And again, get all of that in writing. And some of this can be quite complex and someone might be pretty overwhelmed by the whole process. So ask for a financial counsellor to um, get, get the support of a financial counsellor. And also there's sort of step-by-step -step guides on the National Debt Helpline website to, um, that people can follow as well to guide you through that process. If um, the hardship request is refused by a creditor, um, a person has some rights, so they have the right to make a complaint about that and initially you can make the complaint to what we call the internal dispute resolution area of the creditor um, and see if it can be resolved there or failing that you can take it to the relevant ombudsman which is an independent service that allows um, for people to, you know, to work with the ombudsman and their creditor to try and get to a resolution and I guess once again, a lot of this, if someone is not coping or feeling overwhelmed, they can engage a financial counsellor to assist them with that. But just what's important is to know that they've got rights. And once, if a creditor refuse, refuses a hardship arrangement, that's not the end of the story. There are some other steps a person can take. For when someone's in long-term hardship, um, should Short-term solutions and short-term hardship um, arrangements are not really going to help their underlying situation. So that's where, usually with the support of a financial counsellor, someone might be able to apply for what we call a debt waiver. And that will, it depends on a person's circumstances, but if they've, um, on a Centrelink income, they might have, um, on a disability support pension, they have no assets and their circumstances are unlikely to change, then a debt waiver is often a good way to go. And finally, um, one of the other options is if a person has a, um, a debt that has an asset secured to it, perhaps it's a car loan, if we think about Miriam from the earlier example. If Miriam for, unfortunately wasn't able to find work um, and she was unable to continue to make the payments on the car <coughs> loan, one of the options at that point is surrendering a vehicle where the, the, the car is taken back by the creditor the car is sold, but generally speaking, what happens there is that there is a debt still remaining. And that's where we need to look at more permanent solutions. And one of those is, um, is bankruptcy. And I'll pass over to Shulgin because he's going to talk to us a little bit more about that. Thanks very much. Thanks, Janet. Okay, so just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through this section in too much detail. Uh, but, but I guess the few points I want to raise is uh, to help uh, provide an awareness of what is involved in bankruptcy and also if there's any doubts, please contact the financial counsellor for assistance in relation to this topic. Now, bankruptcy um, is something that we talk about quite a lot at the National Debt Helpline um, to um, the people who call our service. and. It can be someone like Gino, for instance, who um, can no longer work as a self-employed truck driver uh, due to maybe illness. And Gino may be on a Centrelink income now, and on that basis can't afford uh, about, let's say, $80,000 in tax and business debts. He still owes, and this is after he sold all his assets and trucks and equipment. Um, so he's got $80,000 he owes, and he doesn't know what to do. So for Gino, uh, bankruptcy is a formal process that he could look at. And it's the process of declaring yourself unable to pay your debts. And in some circumstances, um, bankruptcy can be initiated by 
uh, the creditor to whom the debt is owed. Uh, but for our discussion today, we're looking at situations where a person voluntarily considers declaring bankruptcy. And so for a person in that position, bankruptcy um, is a huge relief or can be a huge relief. Um, but we must be aware that it's a very serious step and um, your client um, should be confident that they've researched it thoroughly before taking any steps to apply for bankruptcy. And certainly they're welcome to talk to a financial counselor before considering it. So who can declare bankruptcy? Quickly put, it's someone who can't pay their debts when they're due. And the term we use is someone who's personally insolvent. And you need to be living in Australia or have a residential or business connection to Australia to qualify uh, for bankruptcy. Um, there's no minimum or maximum amount of debt that you can bank that um, you need to have before you can bankrupt, or so that precludes you from bankrupting. And same thing with your income, you can earn any amount. Um, you can still declare bankruptcy. And if you have any questions around people who maybe earn a little bit more, how that could affect them, a financial counselor can uh, explain that. Uh, also, and this is very important, uh, declaring bankruptcy is free. Now, a lot of the debt vultures that I mentioned previously will try and convince people to pay to declare bankruptcy. However, if a person does it themselves or through the assistance of a financial counselor, um, they can do so free of charge. So what happens when someone applies for bankruptcy? Essentially, their debts are wiped and the debts uh, basically are in the person's bankrupt estate for uh, three years and one day. And when they're discharged from the bankruptcy after three years and one day, those debts are extinguished. And one of the huge advantages of looking at bankruptcy as an option for a person, once they've considered everything else, is that once the bankruptcy is approved, the debt collectors and creditors stop contacting that person. And just to note that uh, during the bankruptcy, and a trustee is appointed um, to look at the person's financial affairs. And the role of this trustee um, is simply to see if there's any way those debts can be paid. And for a lot of the people we help, um, they, there wouldn't be much there uh, for the trustee to take to pay the debts. Now, what debts does bankruptcy cover? You've got the list there. So just um, normal civil debts, you know, your credit cards, uh, we've got loans, utilities, overdrawn accounts, unpaid rent, um, and other fees, you know, such as our legal or accounting or medical fees. And before a person considers bankrupting, bankrupting the debts listed there, I would suggest uh, they contact a financial counsellor. And so this relates to uh, debts incurred, incurred to government bodies. So Centrelink debts and tax debts, uh, as well as fines, probably need to be looked at by a financial counsellor before a person considers bankruptcy, if that's the main debt that they're dealing with. Please be aware, and, and certainly the people you support need to be aware that there are some debts which are not covered by bankruptcy, and those are listed there. Okay, and I'll just quickly explain what we mean by unliquidated debts. Uh, basically, an unliquidated debt is one that doesn't have an ascertainable amount, and, and that could relate to, for instance, a debt being pursued by an insurance company um, over a motor vehicle accident claim. So one of your clients was involved in a motor vehicle accident and um, the other party's insurer was pursuing them, that potentially is an unliquidated debt. And before your client considers bankrupting that debt, again, after looking at all the other options, I would suggest that they speak to a financial counsellor. Now, all this information, like I said, will be made available to you at the end of the presentation. <coughs> Now, the trustee I was speaking about previously in the bankruptcy uh, does have the ability to take and sell some of a person's uh, possessions, and that's for the purpose of repaying the debt. And so where the person you're helping has a house or a car that is, you know, has a high value or money in the bank or they've just inherited or 
are likely to inherit, we would suggest they speak to a financial counsellor first before looking at bankruptcy as an option to clear that debt, because there will be consequences uh, for those possessions or assets um, if um, they were to declare bankruptcy. And I'll just make a note here as well that bankruptcy also has the ability to affect the assets of a partner um, or someone who's in a relationship with the person uh, who's considering bankruptcy. And that applies even if the partner is not listed on the debt, is not a named person on the debt. So uh, it's very important that a person um, considers bankruptcy or a person considering bankruptcy is aware that the assets of a partner or someone in their relationship could be affected. Now I'm just going to breeze through this next slide. Okay, so that's what a person can keep in bankruptcy. So for Gina speaking to, uh, about before, um, he can keep a vehicle that's worth $7,800 or more, and as well as two tools of the trade uh, that are, uh, sorry, he can keep a vehicle that's worth less than $7,800. And likewise, that he can keep um, tools of trade which are worth less than $3,700. <coughs> Household goods and items are also protected. Um, and here we have a list of the consequences of bankruptcy. So we've covered some of those before. Um, have a look at that. And if you have any questions, feel free um, to speak um, to a financial counselor. And if you have any questions today as well, we are happy to answer those. But the key take home is that bankruptcy um, can give a person a clean slate um, as long as um, their situation um, isn't going to be adversely affected by some of the consequences of bankruptcy listed there. Okay, thanks very much for that, Shungu. Um, as we uh, mentioned right at the beginning of the uh, seminar, because of the, the fact that we're talking to a national audience, we, we mentioned that we were only able to touch briefly on things like utility debts, etc. So what we've, um, what we've done is compile a list of resources that can help you with um, where you might need to go for those sorts of issues. So just very briefly, if you've got um, clients with utility debts, so gas, electricity, water, um, they all have hardship departments, so that's the first go-to place. Check that the person is getting all their relevant concessions applied. Um, and check if there are any eligible, if you're um, any energy support grants in your state or territory. If there are issues with um, energy bills, if you can't come to a resolution, if the person's unhappy with the way they're being, their service or the way they're being billed, etc., every state or territory has a, an energy ombudsman, and the, and the list of those will be provided to you at, at the end of the session. Um, for emergency relief, food vouchers, etc., many of you may be. Um, familiar with your services may in fact provide those supports. Again, it's contact the local, local agencies and we use a, um, a search tool here called Info Exchange Service so Seeker and we'll share that resource with you as well. Um, housing is always something that people are often facing issues with. Again, it's a very specialised area. So we'd encourage you to speak to your local housing agency. Once again, Info Exchange is a good resource for finding this. Um, if people are having issues with uh, their landlord, with rental, um, and this is private rental, um, every state and territory has a, um, a tenants, tenancy organisation. These are usually um, independent and often have advice lines and lots of really useful information. So again, we'd suggest you talk to that, that um, service in your local area. Similarly with fines, if someone has significant fines, contact your local community legal centre. Some of those, I know in Victoria, we have um, services who provide a, a clinic and they have advice lines. And very quickly, lastly, for phone, mobile and internet, um, there is in fact a national ombudsman for that. So once again, talk initially to the hardship department and if you can't resolve the issue, go to the telecommunications industry ombudsman who provides service for the all of us Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Now, I am aware that uh, we've Unmuted. breezed through those last couple of sections um, just due to time, but um, we'd like to just open up to you. And yeah, if you have any questions, please send them through now. 
I believe you can use the chat box um, in your window or you can send it through by email. So we'll just spend a bit of time now answering any questions you have in relation to what we've discussed. So we don't have any questions coming in from the chat box um, just yet. Um, so if you're free to... Hi guys, thanks Janet and Shungu, that was great. I've got the questions here, so I'll read them out for you. We've had a few come in just while you've been talking. Um, so from Brittany, are these rules from the Australian consumer law or elsewhere? Um, Brittany, in relation to the discussion we were having around hardship on credit contracts, that is part of what's called the National Credit Code, which is um, part of the Australian consumer law. So, um, yes, those, it, the, to seek a hardship variation on your, on your credit contract is a right that you do have under that code. Um, so the next question here from Taylor is, um, and I'll just read it out, you stated that the client has a right to being represented by someone such as a financial counsellor. What happens when an authority has been sent by the financial counsellor <coughs> but the debt collector or consumer lease company still contacts the client directly rather than passing all correspondence through the financial counsellor? That's certainly a problem uh, we do hear about. And I would suggest in that situation that um, the person, and I'm assuming the financial counsellor will do this as well, uh, it would be, uh, you have to lodge a complaint with the relevant ombudsman service. And so, um, there's either the financial ombudsman service where you can lodge a complaint, uh, and that's basically an ex external dispute resolution scheme. Um, there's also the credit and investments ombudsman, um, and usually um, the credit investments ombudsman um, has the debt collectors as members, and so complaints can be lodged there. And then through the forum of the complaint, um, any concerns around authorities not being accepted uh, can be looked at, and the negotiation can happen, can happen there as well. Fantastic, thanks Shungu. Um, so the next question here from Tess is, what kinds of credit providers can list a default? Is it anyone who, to whom a debt is owed or just licensed credit providers and utilities and telcos and that kind of thing? You may have answered that question, but if you could clarify. Great, great, great question. And um, um, so basically um, an entity that, um, can list a, a, a default or, a, or other credit notation it can either be a credit provider or an organisation or business that is considered a credit provider for the purpose of listing a default. And so that can actually involve some telcos as well. Um, usually, in order to list a default or other notation, you need to be the member of an ombudsman scheme. And that's specifically with, um, with, um, with defaults. You need to be the member of an ombudsman scheme. So any entity which is not a member of an ombudsman scheme, and some of the more shonky debt collectors tend not to be a member of an ombudsman scheme, then we would argue that should, they shouldn't list a default. <coughs> okay, that's really that the question. Yeah, that's really great to know, <laughs> I think. Um, so this next question from Taylor, um, it's around debt collectors and fees. So if the, if the debt collector has not brought the debt and is just collecting on behalf of another company, what fees, charges and interest are they allowed to charge the client versus if they've bought the debt off the company, what regulates the fees they're able to charge the client there? So sort of two slightly different scenarios. Yeah. So, yeah, so my, my understanding is that um, a debt collector can't charge fees unless they're stipulated in the original contract, which um, the debt is based on, or until whoever holds the debt um, sues them and gets a judgment. So those are the only times um, fees can be required, you know, where the original contract allows for that to happen. And in any case, if it goes to court, whatever is owed or when the, the creditor gets judgment, they can chase that. Um, so if there's any issue around fees, I mean, certainly um, get in touch with your local community legal centre to see if uh, those fees are justified, or like I said, you can speak to a financial counsellor. Great. Um, the next question looks like the last one for the day. So I'll just um, quickly remind people if they'd like to ask a question, um, 
please type your question into the question box and I'll read that one out. Um, so while you're doing that, um, this question from Jessica, what happens if a house registered solely in the bankrupt's name is not sold by the trustee within the period of bankruptcy? Does it remain vested in the trustee? What happens if the owner sells the property two years after being discharged from bankruptcy and there are surplus proceeds? Excellent, excellent question. Yes. And actually dealt with that today for a person. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think what's really important to understand is that once a person declares bankruptcy, those assets now vest in the trustee. And essentially, the trustee calls the shots. And so um, with property, for instance, that uh, vested interest actually continues even after the person is discharged from the bankruptcy. And the person actually isn't able to sell that property because of uh, the trustee's interest in that property. And what we see a lot of times is that um, people declare bankruptcy and maybe they have a house with no or negative equity. And they think that, oh, look, I'll just bankrupt and I'll keep my house. But that's not necessarily the case because um, the trustee's interest can continue for many years after the person's discharged from the bankruptcy. And in the future, if the value of the house goes up, then the trustee can sell the house, even though the person was uh, discharged from the bankruptcy. So if that's a situation that's affecting someone you're helping, please get them to speak to uh, a community legal centre, also a lawyer or uh, a financial counsellor, because they, they need to understand what the impact could be on that asset. Great. That's really good to know. I think um, perhaps people might not realise that and certainly um, it is a potential problem given that there are some areas, particularly in northern Queensland where or central Queensland, where price values have really dropped as a result of mining crashes and stuff like that. So thank you for that. I've just got the final okay. question that's come through from Heather. Um, financial counsellors and inadequacy of some of their training has been highlighted in the current Royal Commission. How do we know if the accredited financial counsellor has adequate knowledge? That's a good question. And I don't know if I'm placed to answer that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, my, look, my understanding is that financial counsellors need to meet certain requirements around their training and they need to be a member of a local a peak body. So um, my, my view is that the, it's, it's the local peak body that would make sure that the financial counsellors um, who, are, who are their members um, get the training they require to give it, uh, to give the assistance that, um, that's required. Um, but uh, yeah, um, no, no, I'm not sure if I can answer that question directly, to be honest. But we, as financial counsellors, we are, um, you know, an accredited service. You know, we do um, have to uh, get training, and you know, we there's a financial counselling diploma that uh, a person needs to hold to work as a financial counsellor. And we have ongoing professional development that we have to continue to have updated training throughout the year. That's right, and also. Um, uh, professional supervision is also a requirement, particularly in Victoria, uh, for holding your financial counselling accreditation. So we do get the support to give the information that's required. And, and so if a person has a problem, I would suggest they speak to that particular agency or peak body in their, in their area. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Hopefully that's um, made everyone feel a little more secure in making referrals to financial counsellors. Um, so we are at time now. So I'd like to thank you very much, um, Shungu and Janet, for presenting today on behalf of everyone listening around the country from their computers. Um, We'll be sending out the links to this PowerPoint again to the recording and um, hopefully to the other documents that have been referred to or the websites that have been referred to if they're not in the PowerPoints, as well as a link to SurveyMonkey for you to provide your feedback. So please have a look out for that later this afternoon or early tomorrow morning. And um, thanks again to Consumer Action Law Centre for talking to us today. Cheers. You're welcome and thanks for participating. Thanks. <laughs> thanks.